So we're about to discuss a case of demonic possession so chilling and controversial that it actually became the movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose. What follows is the true story that inspired that, The Exorcism of Annalise Michelle. It's one of the few like actual cases of uh, demonic possession that went to court. All right. It's a Wait, did they like sue the demon? You'll find out. Okay. Born in 1952 in the small town of Klingenberg in Bavaria, Germany, Annalise Michel was raised as a strict Catholic and was described as very bright and likable. In September 1968, when Annalise was 16 years old, she experienced her first episode of losing consciousness. And later that night, she felt as if something was pressing down on her chest, pinning her to her bed. 11 months later, in August 1969, a similar event occurred, and her mother took Annalise to their family doctor, Dr. Vogt, and a neurologist, Dr. Luthi, who examined her and even ran an EEG, a brain scan, but found nothing wrong. They hypothesized that it could possibly be a form of seizure. Over the next three years, Annalise would have two more similar episodes and was prescribed two medications, an anticonvulsant medication and an anti-seizure medication called Dilantin. On both occasions, an EEG would come back normal, with some minor irregular patterns, but nothing that would definitively explain her symptoms. What year was this? This was in 1969. Okay, I'm fine with that so far. That sounds real. <laughs> okay. Little spiders on me. Sorry if I blew it on you. Well, you did. It was in spring 1973 that things took a turn for the stranger. Annalise began to hear knocking sounds in her bedroom, sounds her sisters would hear as well. But even more alarming, Annalise also reported hearing a voice damning her to hell. Her mother was further rattled when she witnessed Annalise furiously staring at a statue of the Virgin Mary with, quote, eyes turned black, jet black, and her hands seemed to turn into thick paws with claws. What? <laughs> Those are some chunky paws on her daughter. <laughs> Uh-oh. You know what? Let's move on. Let's not get caught up on the bare hands. I, I, you know, I shouldn't have even said you that can, Yeah, we can't I, move I, past her I, having paws. I knew, I knew you weren't gonna like that. I'm just she gonna move past. She had a little kitty cat paws. In September 1973, in a neurological visit with Dr. Luthi, Annalise described horrific visions of demon faces that were tormenting her and stated that she felt the devil was inside her. She also reported smelling something that had the aroma of burnt feces, a stench that many around her would report smelling at later times. Why do all these people know what burnt feces smells like? Well, I can imagine it just smells like Species like with a little, shit on fire? a little, a little smokier. Fucking, oh, fuck, is that a bee? <laughs> see what you get. This is what you get. Yes, see come on. Oh, <laughs> Around this time, Annalise's mother described these strange occurrences to Doctor Luthi, who, according to Mrs. Michelle, advised them to consult a Jesuit. A claim that Doctor Luthi would later deny. Yeah, that's a bad doctor. Yeah, I don't. Mean, if he said that, don't go see it. <laughs> that's fucked up, right? Yeah. Whether or not that's true, the family definitely searched for a priest and eventually found a priest named Father Alt. In November 1973, Annalise met with a Freudian psychiatrist who diagnosed her as a neurotic with possible epilepsy and another neurologist found she had, quote, epileptic patterns and took her off Dilantin and put her on Tegretol, a much stronger drug. In July 1975, Annalise's extremely odd behavior worsened. She barely slept and prayed fervently all night. She ate spiders and flies, and even licked her own urine up from the floor. She destroyed rosaries, crucifixes, and holy pictures on the walls. Annalise also exhibited strength that was, quote, close to superhuman, throwing her sister, quote, as if she were a rag doll, and incredibly was observed effortlessly squeezing an apple with one hand until, quote, fragments exploded throughout the room. I bet I could squeeze an apple till it exploded. I bet you a million dollars you couldn't. Here we go. I mean, this is Germany. This is before preservatives. You hear that in the distance? It's the excuse train coming. <laughs> Wait for it. You're full of shit, Ryan. We're gone. <laughs> but now you can't just see two hands. What? She definitely used two hands. You said one hand. Oh! <laughs> okay. But still, that's not like a amazing metric. A priest named Father Rodewick, a man considered an expert on exorcisms by his peers, reported that he was convinced that Annalise was possessed, and after deliberation with the bishop, an exorcism on Annalise was formally approved. It was to be carried out by a priest named Father Renz. On September 24th, 1975, the first exorcism rite was performed. Father Renz allowed some of the exorcism sessions to be recorded, and 42 audio recordings of the exorcisms were made in total. I'm gonna play some clips from those recordings, but fair warning, these recordings are perhaps the most disturbing pieces of audio I've ever heard. I just did a hard time. I can't believe that. 
so, dass ich in dem Wald ein bin. Ich trag dir die Rotznase noch so lang, bis es treffen wird. Ich saufle die Leute. Ah, für uns geht's kein Zurück. Nee, in alle Ewigkeit. You know, she's screaming. She's giving it 110%. I mean, do you think that sounds like it came out of a girl? Like, yes, it sounds like a girl doing a funny voice. Do you, uh... Your unrelenting skepticism is exhausting. <laughs> it, it, it drains me of all happiness and energy, and I, I hope you know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. We're all here. <laughs> it's all. I ran out of evil people to think of. Uh, the blonde man from Die Hard is also in here. Skeletor from Masters of the Universe. Heath Ledger's Joker. <laughs> Not Jack Nicholson. He was too cartoonish. You had your fun. You yeah, asked. I've had my fun. Though. Okay. Annalise also named Fleischmann as one of her demons and provided accurate details of the real Fleischmann, who was a priest in the 1500s that was kicked out of the church for bad behavior. These details came as an icy shock to Father Alt, who claims Annalise would have no way of knowing Fleischmann. That is the only thing that is strange to me. All the other stuff is just things that a person could do. To learn more about demonic possession, we sat down with Father Gary Thomas, a Vatican-approved exorcist, who explained to us different signs of possession all of these Annalise had. One would be an aversion to the sacred. So a person walks in this church and can't look at a crucifix, and they, you only see the whites of their eyes. Another would be knowledge of hidden things, where the demon will begin to tell you things about yourself that, it, that the person themselves would have no way of knowing. Another would be um, possessing a kind of um, inordinate um, physical strength that they don't normally possess. The last, the last sign is sort of epileptic-like seizures on a person's face and the movement of their arms and legs in a way where they lose complete control. By May, Annalise became even worse, banging her head against the wall and biting herself and others to the point where her family had to tie her up to prevent her from hurting herself. But most dangerously, Annalise refused to eat. She described it as, quote, not being permitted to eat. Despite being quite frail, likely weighing under 80 pounds, she exhibited great strength when people tried to restrain her. Yeah, I just feel bad for her at this point. Yeah, I do feel bad for She's her. She's definitely tortured. By June, Annalise's entire face was sunken. She also refused a doctor visit, even though she had a very high fever. On June 30th, Annalise had another exorcism, only saying, please, absolution. The next morning, her family went to her room and found her dead. Despite seeking medical attention early on, Annalise refused to submit to medical attention in the end, as she and her family ultimately placed all faith of recovery into the exorcisms. She died of starvation at the age of 23 after 67 exorcisms, weighing only 68 pounds at the time of her death. Do you think that just made her like buy into it more? If people started exercising me, on the reg. Exercising you on the reg? Yeah, I might eventually be like, I guess I'm demons. I would agree with that frame of mind, but Annalise's belief that she was possessed predates yeah, all the... The, the exorcisms or the priests or any of that stuff. After her death, Annalise's parents and the two priests were accused of negligent homicide, and the case went to trial in 1978. What follows are the two sides of that case. First, let's review the position of the defense. The defense presented eyewitness testimony and formally submitted the recordings as evidence of possession, an idea that the court never seemed to take seriously. From a non-religious standpoint, the defense argued Annalise was permitted to deny medical treatment as was her lawful right. For what it's worth, medical treatment might have included tranquilizing her, force feeding her, and electroshock therapy, quote, all presumably against her will, end quote. Family friend Thea Hine recalled in her testimony that in 1976, a few months before Annalise's death, Annalise reportedly, quote, begged on her knees for Hine to not suggest medical attention to anybody. Also worth noting is the fact that Father Alt actually looked for medical help towards the end. And on May 30th, his friend, Dr. Richard Roth, visited Annalise out of what he claims was scientific curiosity and not as a physician. <laughs> he just was like, I'm, look, I'm not here as a doctor. I just want to see some of this crazy shit. I know, who fucking says that? I want to see this girl eat some spiders. That's like something you say when you go to the zoo, yeah. not when you go see someone yeah. that's tied up. That is a bad man right there. Okay. Uh, In his visit, Dr. Roth claims Annalise had no external injuries, 
although Father Renz noted she had several bruises, a swollen cheek, and black eyes. An interesting contradiction, to say the least. Dr. Roth also denied saying, quote, there are no injections against the devil, end quote. Shady. Shady as fuck. Yeah. Right? Curiously, in spite of all the supposed epileptic attacks, an autopsy revealed Annalise had a healthy brain with no damage that could have caused epileptic seizures. Quote, not even on a microscopic level, end quote. What say you to that? I mean, you know, I, oh look, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, what, what's a brain scientist? What a neurologist? <laughs> yeah, there we go, sorry, it's been a long day. I'm not a neurologist, I don't know what the... It's funny that you said that, because the neurologist said the exact same thing. Yeah, he said I'm not a neurologist? Uh, probably, it sounds like it, it sounds, he might as well. <laughs> Look, I don't uh, fucking, fucking know. I don't know, go visit a Jesuit. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Just get your shit fucking... stink out of my office. <laughs> And even more curious was the court's seeming non-consideration of facts, such as her pupils being unusually dilated and the absence of ulcers on her body, which are frequently found in victims of starvation. Okay, all right. Any quotes on that? I mean, you know. This is great. The tables have turned, in my opinion. Now, let's review the position of the prosecution. The prosecution argued that Annalise had epilepsy and psychosis, and that the parents and two priests were liable for failing to act to save her life. The defense tore down notions of possession. They questioned the credibility of Father Alt, with the conclusion from two experts that Father Alt exhibited signs of schizophrenia. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Yeah, that's weird. That's weird. He wasn't the guy that was doing the exorcisms, but he was the guy that initially helped Annalise yeah. in the beginning. The prosecution the prosecution also argued that the medications given successfully suppressed the epilepsy-like seizures and argued that that suppression morphed into, quote, a delusional psychosis associated with epilepsy, end quote. They argued that Annalise's psychosis was exacerbated by the exorcism, which only played into her fantasy. To piggyback on that, Annalise often went through phases between exorcisms where she behaved normally, even though she would behave as a possessed person during exorcisms. It's unclear if the epilepsy-like seizures were stopped by medication or if they actually stopped on their own. But Annalise's psychotic visions predate the alleged medical suppression. Weird. <laughs> Sorry. Weird. Sorry. Basically, they're saying that the psychosis was brought on by the suppression of the drugs. Yeah. But the psychosis but predates, predates the drugs. Yeah. Exactly. In the end, the court ruled in favor of the prosecution, sentencing the four defendants to six months in prison with suspension for three years and payment for all court costs. The court ruled that Annalise was unable to make decisions for herself and should have been forced to submit to medical care. Professor Felicitas D. Goodman, an author of a book on the case, notes the theories that Annalise was epileptic were presented as, quote, a statement of undisputable fact, not conjecture, as in fact they had been, end quote. How do you tell the difference between possession and mental health? Sometimes both are going along side by side. You have to determine what is the root cause of the suffering of this individual. Okay. You start out with a discernment, and the discernment involves myself and a whole team of people. I have uh, a medical doctor, a clinical psychologist, and a psychiatrist. In fact, a formal exorcism only happens as the last resort. Given the evidence that we've seen and all the strange occurrences and the voices, Again. I think there is sufficient evidence to not conclusively rule out that she was possessed beyond a reasonable doubt. Sure. So you acknowledge that? I acknowledge there's a lot of factors in this case. I personally think there's something going on with mental health, and I also think that 67 exorcisms probably don't, don't leave your mind in a good spot. I could see both sides. I could see how it would be mental health. I could see how it would be a possession. I lean towards possession. That being said, she should have gone to the hospital. Yeah, get that girl to a hospital, please. She's possessed or not, fucking force her to go to the hospital and let the doctors be like, holy shit, the shit's floating around. PSA, if your kid's eating spiders. Don't take him to an exorcist. Take him to an exorcist, but do it at the hospital. No, don't take them to, take them straight to the hospital. You can do both, that's what I'm saying, you can do both. You can have it happen at the hospital. Okay, that's fine, yeah. Regardless of the court ruling, many have debated what actually led to Annalise's death. Was it a case of mental illness, possibly epilepsy? Or was this a legitimate case of demonic possession? Whatever the real reason may be, the case of Annalise Michel is a tragedy and will always remain unsolved. I think we're done here. No, we're not. I'm gonna crush this. <laughs> You're not crushing it. I'm gonna get some juice out of this thing. I don't know what's making me happier, the fact that uh, you can't get it, or the struggle on your face as you see your, your case slipping through your fingers. This like is not a case sand. slipping through my fingers. Just like grains of sand just falling.